This morning we have gathered together to begin the process of describing some of the implements that Bezalel carved and built that were part of the tabernacle. And uh, you know, even as in that movie that uh, kind of defined some of us in a, in a generation ago, uh, we decided, by the way, not to show the last scene of that. Uh, for those familiar, that we thought the children would all kind of get freaked out, and some of us too. But uh, the whole idea, of course, was a group of people that were pursuing the Ark of the Covenant so they could get its special power, its special authority, and have, have power in and of themselves. Well, people still are seeking the Ark. They, they still want an object to worship. They still want something that, uh, for some reason, will give them something for faith that uh, they feel they're missing. You know, and uh, the, the Ark really cried out specific uh, restrictions upon it. As a matter of fact, it, when, once the temple and the tabernacle was consecrated, no one was allowed to see the Ark of the Covenant. Only one person could see it, and that was only once a year. The whole thing screamed out restricted access. And throughout, uh, since the book of Genesis, God gave us restricted access to certain things. Remember, he gave Adam and Eve restricted access, even in the garden. Do not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. He said, do not go and touch the ark. As a matter of fact, parents still today say, kids, you're grounded. You're on restriction if you disobey, right? Teens, do they still do that? You guys still get grounded out there? Parents, do you still ground your kids? Yes, <laughs> thank you. One parent out there. So, you know, because you place them on restrictions, usually as a benefit, and to help them and, and, and for protection, even though kids don't understand that. But uh, the idea of restricted access, I, I remember a few years ago when I was in student ministries, my wife and I were at a major music festival. I mean, there was all these big bands and famous speakers, and some of those performers still go today, like Toby Mac and some others. And uh, I had seen someone at the festival who I knew, and he uh, was an artist, and he invited us backstage. I said, this is really cool. We get to go backstage, and we were able to eat with some of the artists. We were able to fellowship with them and talk with them. And uh, I thought this was really great. But as we came into the backstage area, we all had to get a pass to hang around our neck. And I was next up in line, and the guy said, I need your name. So he wrote Bruce Hughesby, and this big pass, I hung around my neck, said, Restricted Access. Well, Debbie was next in line, and they handed her a pass, and the guy goes, huh, that's interesting, but writes, what's your name? Debbie Hughesby, puts it on the pass, and her pass said, All Access. Well, <laughs> I didn't know what that all meant, but then they described it to me. They said, I would be restricted to certain areas backstage. I could go only in those areas because there'd be security that would stop me if I tried to go anywhere else. Debbie, on the other hand, could go anywhere. She could go on the stage. She could go on the stage while people were performing. I go, that's just not fair. <laughs> because I thought I'm the one that wants to be there, and I thought getting pictures of these people would be really cool. So I since my name obviously wasn't Debbie, I couldn't go on stage. <laughs> but I made my wife go on stage and take pictures of those artists, even while they were performing, because she had all access. Well, the Ark of the Covenant, the only person who had an all access pass, was the high priest. And we'll describe some of that this morning. And in a message like this, and the text we're going to look at, sometimes we say, how in the world do we look at something that is in some ways impersonal? But we trust through what God will challenge us with this morning, you'll see how this applies to our lives in great ways. If you have your Bibles, look with me this morning to the book of Exodus as we continue our series. Exodus chapter 37, it's page 67 in your pew Bible. Exodus chapter 37. And follow along with me as I read the first nine verses. I'll stop along the way just to describe a couple of highlights. Exodus 37, verse 1. It says, Bezalel made the ark of acacia wood. I'm just going to stop there a minute, because for many of us, what difference does the wood make? Well, acacia wood was the hardest wood in that region, in the Middle East. It was known to be insect resistant, and it was a type of wood that would last a very long time. It was made of two and a half cubits long, a cubit and a half wide, and a cubit and a half high. He overlaid it with pure gold, both inside and out. 
he made a gold molding around it. Now, from last week's message, where did the gold come from? Egypt. The gold had come from Egypt when the Israelites plundered the Egyptians, and uh, some of it even could have come from the golden calf when it was remelted down. But it says he cast four gold rings for it and fastened them to the two rings out of the other. He made, then he made poles of acacia wood and overlaid them with gold. And by the way, in Exodus 25, it says those poles were never to be removed. And uh, he made the atonement cover of pure gold, two and a half cubits long and a cubit and a half wide. Then he made two cherubim out of hammered gold at the ends of the cover. He made one cherub on one end and the second cherub on the other. At the two ends, he made them of one piece with the cover. The cherubim had their wings spread upward, overshadowing the cover with them. The cherubim faced each other, looking toward the cover. Let's uh, look to the Lord in prayer, shall we, as we start this morning. Father, we praise you and we thank you for the opportunity we have to gather in your house this day. We thank you that you give us uh, some interesting facts that surround the building of your tabernacle. And as we look at some of those facts this morning and how they really impact our life, we pray that your Holy Spirit would be the true teacher this morning. And Lord, we just look forward to what you have for us and what application there can be for our life. And we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, as the children noticed, the first thing you see when you look at the Ark of the Covenant are the cherubim. And uh, there's a couple things from Scripture we know about cherubim. One of them, of course, is found in the book of Genesis. And uh, in Genesis chapter 3, after Adam and Eve had sinned, we see after he drove the man out, he placed on the east side of the Garden of Eden cherubim and a flaming sword flashing back and forth to guard the way of the tree of life. So we see apparently a role that cherubim have was that of guard and protector. But we see in Isaiah another role. In Isaiah chapter 37, it says, O Lord Almighty, God of Israel, enthroned between the cherubim, you alone are God over all the kingdoms of the earth. You have made heaven and earth. So we see another role in many ways of cherubim, and that role is one of worship and close proximity to God. Let me just read a, a passage out of the book of Ezekiel as well. A fascinating passage as we think about what cherubim may have looked at like. Uh, just quickly, just listen. It says, Then one of the cherubim, in chapter 10, verse 7, reached out his hand to the fire that was among them, and he took some of it and put it in the hands of the linen. So apparently they're very fire-resistant. <laughs> chapter 12, they're in, or verse 12, rather, their entire bodies, including their backs, their hands, their wings were completely full of eyes. Boy, talk about your mother with eyes behind her head. Cherubim could see everything. Each of the cherubim in verse 14 says had four faces. One face was that of a cherub, the second like a face of man, the third the face of a lion, the fourth the face of an eagle. And then in verse 21 it says each had four faces and four wings and under their wings was what looked like the hands of a man. Incredible description of these objects that Bezalel was commanded to carve out of pure gold into the cover of the Ark of the Covenant. What their exact purpose was may have been protection for the contents, but more than likely as a symbol of the proximity of the presence of God. And of course, the Ark was placed in the room that we term as the holy of holies or the most holy place. If you look in the back of your notes, that little diagram of the tabernacle, you'll see in the main tent area where only the priests were allowed to go was the holy place or that first larger room. That was the place where the showbread table was, where the, where the incense altar was, and where the, the a candlestick was. And this is the place where priests would do their worship and certain sacrifices. But of course, separating that room from the 15 by 15 foot approximate room was the Holy of Holies, the most holy place. And the only object within that was the Ark of the Covenant. And separating those rooms was a curtain. A curtain that consisted of three colors, of blue, of purple, and of crimson red. It was also adorned with cherubim and embroidered into it. Now, what those colors mean, Scripture does not tell us. 
Some theologians have speculated that every day when those priests would go in to, to worship God, those three colors became very significant. The blue was significant because God's continued provision from the earth of the manna that was provided. And also the hope that they had of going someday into the land that flowed with milk and honey so that they would take possession of it and the hope in the future of entering the promised land. The purple signifying that they were truly children of the king, that they had been chosen as God's people and that they would remember constantly that they were under the authority of Almighty God. The, the crimson red, a constant reminder of even what they were performing in their priestly tasks, that it took blood to bring about the mercy of God. Now we can look at those three colors even to, for us today and, and whether or not the symbols have any meaning, but it should also bring, even as it brought to the minds of the priests in the Old Testament, it should bring to our minds as well the thoughts of worship and the thoughts of thanksgiving, thanksgiving and gratefulness and the thoughts of our future hope. The fact that the blue can indicate what God will give us someday in the new earth as we inhabit that together with him. The purple, the fact that we are all children of the king and we worship the king of kings and the Lord of lords. And that someday, as the bride of Christ, his church, we will join with the bridegroom as royalty in heaven. And the red, to remind us of the ultimate sacrifice that had to be paid. So we have that hope, that sacrifice by Christ. But the primary area we want to look at is really that of the ark. And the ark had two primary focuses and functions. First and foremost, it was the worship of God. If you're still in uh, the book of Exodus, the 37th chapter, just go over, go over a few pages to chapter 40. To chapter 40. Look at verse uh, 34 with me. It says, and this is when... Moses had consecrated the, the tabernacle and says, then the cloud covered the tent of meeting and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Moses could not enter the tent of meeting because the cloud had settled upon it and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Now here's the cloud that had led the, the nation by day and the fire by night. It came when the tabernacle was dedicated and settled over the tent of meeting and God's presence settled right over the ark. And when God looked down upon his people, it was a sign that his people in turn could look up to God in worship. And uh, to worship Yahweh, and as we look at this fact, what an incredible picture of God's eminence. In other words, his closeness to us. That they could see the cloud. It was visible for them. They could understand that this was God's presence close at hand. And yet God's transcendence. Sometimes that untouchable part of God where, where the ark had limited access. People couldn't see it. Only the high priest could and only once a year. And the glory of God, which, which indicated so much of his transcendence the worship of God, the opportunity we have to come together as a body and worship. And that's what it meant for the nation of Israel. That's what the ark signified. And for us today, as we think about worship, as we think about our opportunity to come into God's house, to, to engage in song and study and fellowship and being at a position where we bend the knee and bow the knee to a holy God, even though we can enjoy that type of imminence by seeing changed lives. Sometimes the transcendence of God does become a little confusing, doesn't it? We just wish God was a little closer sometimes. Would, would kind of show up. Where's the cloud, Lord? You know, come on down and show us. But the fact is, is God during certain times expressed and, and showed himself in very different ways. And during this period of the Old Testament, we see God's eminence and his transcendence especially over the tabernacle. Now, if we look at the book of Leviticus, one of the interesting things we can see in worship, it says this, I will put my dwelling place among you, and I will not abhor you. I will walk among you and will be your God, and you will be my people. God, again, showing his love, his compassion, his care. But the one thing, and as I was pointing out the children, is that the focal point of the ark is not the cherubim, is not the horns, is not the handles. It's the center area. The center area called the mercy seat. The mercy seat. 
It really comes from the idea that of an Old Testament word that's pronounced kephareth, and it meant the place of at one meant. Or we put that word together to be atonement. And it was here on the mercy seat that atonement for sins was made. And as we look at the, actually the root word of that, it's a word that uh, is kaporth, who, which has the idea of covering. And so when we talk about the cover, really it was the covering of the cover. And, and it's very significant to understand that Old Testament word because when we think about the fact of those sins that were confessed by the high priest year by year was a covering, it was a covering for people's sins. You got to understand God and his power and his authority and his majesty, when he looked down from heaven and he looked down on this mercy seat and you remember what was contained within the ark was what? The law of God. He saw the law, didn't he? He saw the law that brings judgment, the law that kills. But when the high priest would sprinkle blood on this mercy seat, guess what God saw? He saw the blood. And as a result of the blood, sins were covered. Sins were atoned for. And that's what gave hope like David wrote in Psalm 103. As far as the east is from the west, so far as he removed our transgressions from us. That's the hope that this gave them through this celebration of the Day of Atonement. Micah says this in Micah chapter 7, I believe it is. Who is a God like you who pardons sin and forgives the transgression of the remnant of his inheritance? You do not stay angry forever, but delight to show mercy. You will, have, you will again have compassion on us. You will tread our sins underfoot and hurl all our iniquities into the depth of the sea. Wow, the Old Testament people, they had that great hope, didn't they? That their sins had been covered. So the ark stood for worship. The ark stood for the fact of atonement. But then something very uh, unique started to take place. Uh, something that uh, would change a lot of course of history. But before we get there, as we think about this day of atonement, as we think about what happened, Sometimes it's important to uh, understand maybe the danger of being a high priest back in ancient Israel. Uh, I don't know about you, but uh, sometimes you read about dangerous jobs. There's a cable television program called The World's Most Dangerous Jobs, and then there's that one, all us guys go, oh, oh, you know, that ice road trucker thing where they travel across ice and take their lives in their hands and crazy things. Well, here are the 10 most dangerous jobs in America. All right, I don't know if anybody does these. I think some of you do. Number 10 is truck driver. Okay, 10th most dangerous job. Number nine, construction worker. Number eight, a farmer. Number seven, electrical power installers. <laughs> I know we have some of these in church. Number six, a roofer. How many have ever fallen off a roof? Yeah, it can be dangerous. Um, here, I thought this one, number five is rather interesting. Sales, driving sales workers that have to drive long distances, sales, sales people that have to drive a lot. Number four, structural metal workers, those guys who, who walk the high iron. Number three, pilots. Uh, number two, fishermen. And number one are lumberjacks or timber cutters. Now, these statistics are taken from number of fatalities <laughs> per thousand. Uh, there are probably more dangerous jobs that don't involve quite so many people. I think I heard years ago that one of the most dangerous jobs is being a crop duster. Well, there's probably not a lot of crop dusters around. But being a high priest in ancient Israel was kind of a dangerous job. You see, days before the Day of Atonement, or Yom Kippur, which they, with Jews, call that celebration and that, uh, that holiday, is, is preceded by a high priest having to go through incredible amount of rituals. Not only in the diet they ate, but the sacrifices they would make, the clothing, the baths that they had to take. It was, it was a long preparation. And when the Day of Atonement would come, they would have to do some more sacrifices. They would then have to, again, wash themselves certain ways. And they would enter the holy place pretty much looking uh, in garb like you see here on stage. 
And then in that area, they would remove the royal part of their regalia and look like a common priest. They would take it off and walk in with basically the white ephod. And oral tradition says that they would put a rope around the ankle of that high priest. And if the high priest had forgotten one sin, one bath, one meal had been prepared improperly, and they entered behind the curtain into the Holy of Holies, the holy presence of God would strike them dead. And if in an allotted time, the priests outside worshiping hadn't heard from the high priest, they would literally pull on the rope, and if he was dead, they would drag him out. How many want that job? (laughs) You know, you have to keep really detailed records of what you're doing, don't you? But that's what the high priest would do. And he'd bring within, into the Day of Atonement, he'd bring a basin, a gold basin of blood from a sacrificed goat. And we know later in the Old Testament, we know there was actually two goats. One that was sacrificed for the Day of Atonement, another was the scapegoat that was sent out in the wilderness. But that high priest would then sprinkle the blood on the mercy seat for the atonement of sins for the nation. A dangerous job. But as I mentioned, then something changed. Changed the course of history. How many of you like change out there? Anybody really love change? You guys are just, I mean, you crank. I love change. I want to tell you, I love change, especially when I'm leading it. (laughs) I mean, I can't understand why everybody doesn't change more rapidly with me. I love change when I'm leading it. But, you know, change is a scary thing. Uh, One of my favorite little books is a little book called Who Moved My Cheese? Anybody ever hear of that little book, Who Moved My Cheese? It's about four little characters, uh, Skib and Scurry and Hem and Haw, and and, uh, about how when somebody moves their cheese out of the maze, they've got to adjust, and two of them go off and find new cheese, and the others just kind of sit around and wait to die because they're not willing to change. So uh, what does that have to do with anything? Well, change sometimes is hard, but change sometimes brings incredible differences in the way people look at things. I mean, think about four years ago, almost four years ago now. Did we expect as a body to be where we are today? I mean, think about the nervousness when Pastor Ed resigned. And yet today, we praise God for his 18 years of ministry here, but today are we thankful for the change God's given us with Pastor Jim? And we've been able to grow so significantly under his ministry as well. And, And you think of major change. I mean, think about 150 years ago, If you're African-American in the United States and you heard Abraham Lincoln declare the Emancipation Proclamation, did that start to bring about change? Yeah, the way people thought, the way people were were acting, it brought about change. It took a long time, but it started to bring around change. Well, a major change in history took place. And it didn't take place in an Old Testament setting. It took place in the book of John. John. John the Baptist was baptizing. All of a sudden, he looked up and said these words, Behold, attention, listen to me. There is the Lamb of God, Jesus, who takes away the sin of the world. Now, why is that so powerful? Why is that important? Go with me to the book of Hebrews, if you will, or look on the screen. Let's read this together, shall we? Get you involved here a bit. Read this passage with me. The law is only a shadow of the good things that are coming, not the realities themselves. For this reason, it can never, by the same sacrifices repeated endlessly, year after year, make perfect those who draw near to worship. If it could would they not have stopped being offered? For the worshipers would have been cleansed once for all and would no longer have felt guilty for their sins. But those sacrifices are an annual reminder of sins because it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. That annual reminder of the Day of Atonement was a reminder of sin. And get that, not one of those sacrifices of bulls or goats took away any sin. They only covered sin. But Jesus, the Lamb of God, would take away the sins of the world. And you see what was required. Hebrews tells us this as well in Hebrews 9. In fact, the law requires that nearly everything be cleansed with blood, for without the shedding of blood, there is 
no remission of sin. Anselm, the Archbishop of Canterbury in 1098, had this wonderful, wonderful quote. Listen to the power of it and catch the power for you and I. The terrible sin of man has offended the honor of the infinite holy God, and the righteous requirements of his offended justice demands satisfaction, demands atonement. But this satisfaction must be achieved by a human being, inasmuch as that it is the sins of human beings which must be removed from the sight of God. Such a payment cannot be made by another sinful human being, but only one accredited with infinite worth before God. The one who makes such atonement, such satisfaction, must therefore not only be human, but also God. What an incredible thing. The only way to stop the sacrificial system was to have a perfect sacrifice that was not only man, but God. You know, when we look at the sacrificial system, it's rather interesting, isn't it? We look at Adam and Eve, and after they sinned, they had coverings of what? Animal skins, right? God had to sacrifice, didn't he? For one. We look at the Passover, and when the Passover lamb came, a family had to sacrifice for the safety of their family. When we look at the Ark of the Covenant and the high priest, when he'd come in and make a sacrifice, he was offering a sacrifice for the whole nation. But now, not just one, not just a family, not a nation, but the whole world has a sacrifice through Jesus Christ. And you see, when we look at the fact of what Hebrews continues to tell us, notice what it says in verse, chapter 2, verse 17. For this reason, he had to be made like his brothers and sisters in every way, in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God, and that he might make atonement for the sins of the people. That's an interesting translation there, by, by the way. Atonement really is a word only found in the Old Testament. When the Greek tried to interpret that Hebrew word, it really is better interpreted in this verse as reconciliation. That God reconciled us to himself. And as a matter of fact, in chapter 9, there's there's another atonement there if you read in Hebrews chapter 9, and that word is better translation, propitiation. Whew, that's a big word, isn't it? One of those big theological things. And propitiation basically means that a ransom has been paid that this is what it cost me so that you could have freedom. And you see, when we think about the fact of the atonement, the fact of being reconciled, of being, having a propitiation, in other words, someone who's a substitute that stood in our place, really becomes the power of what we remember about the ark. But it doesn't stop there. In Hebrews 7, notice what it says. Verse 26, such a high priest truly meets our need. One who is holy, blameless, pure, set apart from sinners, exalted above the heavens. Unlike other high priests, he does not need to offer sacrifices day after day. First for his sins and then for the sins of people. See, that's what the high priest had to do. He sacrificed for their sins once for all when he offered himself. See, scripture talks about us, doesn't it? And our disobedience to God. Scripture often calls that iniquity, transgression, sin. It says in Isaiah that all we like sheep have gone astray. It says in Romans 3, verse 23, that all have sinned and fall short of God's glory. But God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. You see, all have sinned. All we like sheep have gone astray. But God wants to give us his all-access pass because he says he's not willing that any should perish but that all should come to repentance. And get this, he said, everyone or all who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And you know, we sit here today and we look at the construction that Bezalel did of the Ark of the Covenant 
as a symbol that he never saw again, but a symbol of worship, a symbol of atonement. And we realize, you know what? A lot of treasure seekers can go look for it. It doesn't really matter. Because when Jesus took our sins on the cross, when he hung there, and when he cried, it is finished. That curtain that for centuries had screamed restricted access, that had screamed no one allowed but the high priest, split from top to bottom so the most vile sinner could look in and not even get sick. Why? Because God's presence was no longer there. Because God's presence was offered to us to have all access to him through a relationship with Jesus Christ in which he, we then become the temples of the Holy Spirit. We become the walking holy of holies. We become those individuals who can understand and know what atonement is all about. Now when we think about that, many of us have come to that place in our lives where we understand that relationship for Christ. But some of you here this morning may not. For those of us who are in Christ, just think of this verse from Hebrews as well. It says, he entered heaven itself to appear for us in God's presence. Just think about that. And he's still there today. And you know what? He intercedes for us day by day and what hope that should give us. But if you don't know Jesus here today, and if you want to know what it's like to have all access, to know the joy and the forgiveness of sin and the hope it brings for an eternity, we'd love to tell you how you can do that. We're gonna be singing a song in just a few minutes and, and we'll be standing and if you wanna hear more about how you can know Jesus, I'll be down front. But for those of us who would like to see the Ark of the Covenant again someday, guess what? Look at what Revelation says, chapter 11. Then God's temple in heaven was opened and within his temple was what? Seeing the Ark of the Covenant. You want to see it with me? Join God's all-access plan. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the opportunity we've had to be here this morning. And if, Lord, I pray for those here who are sitting here who know Jesus. They're confident that they have their all-access pass. I pray that they would live in the hope of, of what the death of Christ means, and the hope of the future, and the awesome privilege of worship. But Lord, this morning, I want to especially pray for those people here who aren't sure they have an all-access pass. They're not sure that they have a relationship with Jesus. And Lord, you've shown us in your word that, that even though we needed a sacrifice, you loved us so much that you sent Jesus for us. And I pray that uh, anyone here this morning that doesn't know you would seek out one of us today, come down front or, or go to the prayer room and hear how they could have a relationship with Christ before they leave this place. Lord, we love you. We thank you for this time this day. In Jesus' name, amen.